do this thing? There we go. We're recording. Yeah, I just noticed it. Had to click that out of the way. Happy Saturday morning, afternoon, evening, Sunday morning, everyone. Um, and, um, it's nice to see familiar faces and some that aren't as familiar, but uh, we're getting there. 16 people. Um, despite my short notice and not including the links, boy, am I out of practice. But this this should be fun. Thank you, Clark, for for bringing up the topic. And I do have a few others that are almost lined up. Um, miss doing these things. We have an interesting, oh boy, trying to figure out how to use Zoom. I've actually used Zoom a bit for classes. And in fact, I've got a, uh, this week I'm on Zoom, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, all square dance caller related stuff. Um, our presenter this week, this month, this year, have we done one this year yet? I think not quite, maybe December 31st or 30th, um, is somebody whom we've had on here several times before. Um, I do have an introduction written out. Oh old stuff calls challenge through party through party nights and is an avid contra dancer most people i say calls party nights through challenge but with clark it's in the other direction <laughs> he's been a member of caller lab for who knows when been on the board of governors on the executive committee um has done forever on um the definitions committee and for me the biggest thing is that he's been a good friend for many many years um, from all the way from massachusetts let's have a big hand in introduction for clark baker why thank you so what does this mean? Host disabled participant screen sharing. It means the host never turned on participant screen sharing. Try again, please. Here we go. Uh, we will take a risk and share my desktop. And let's go not to what I was doing here, but pages. Okay. So if we're lucky, you can see my screen and it's of a sufficient size and you can hear me okay, correct? Yes. Okay. This, so this supposed to be 2022 or 2023. Ah, thank you. First typo, you get the dollar. Yep. Um so today's subject is artificial intelligence and trying to relate that to square dancing. Um, and I'm hoping that by the end of the talk, you will have seen many examples of chatting with a computer program that maybe exhibits intelligence and we'll talk on the subject of square dancing and maybe calling and dancing. And we'll also have another program um, which works in a similar way um, and ask it to draw some pictures we're, we'll just give it the caption for the picture and it will create the picture out of who knows its own brain or something. Um, before we go too far into this, I wanted to speak briefly. So what is artificial intelligence, often abbreviated AI? And um, one could say it's the simulation of human intelligence by a computer and we're trying to make the computer think and act like a human, if, if that's possible. And there's all sorts of areas. This could include vision and images and speech and decision-making or the ability to learn and get better and smarter, et cetera. And this has been going on in um, antiquity. People have thought about this. In science fiction, people have written about it. And then in the 1950s, people have actually started having conferences and talking and working on it. And here we are today. 
Um, so the next thing we might want to talk about, because this is what we'll be talking to today, is a chat bot. Um, and chat bots are just computer programs that kind of can maintain a conversation with the user, usually in a natural language like English. And in theory, the chat bot is understanding the previous parts of the conversation and replying based on um, what it's heard so far. And a chat bot has often been programmed with a preset set of rules and data to help you. And in the older days, chat bots would be used to try to help you. Um, maybe you're calling the customer support line for an airline and maybe they don't have enough agents. So they you'll talk to a computer for a while and it will try to help you as much as it can or something. Um, and we're going to talk to it, what might be a chat bot today. Um, and you guys are already familiar with these things because uh, we maybe use things we talk to, for example, Siri on Apple computers and phones. Um, Alex is the Amazon program that came out in 2013. You notice I don't call it by its real name because I have one in the room and I don't want to trigger it. And then there's also a Google Assistant, which friends of mine use. Um, and, and these are, are relatively restricted in what they know about. You can ask Google to turn on and off the lights, and you can ask Alex to, you know, what's the temperature today, or play some radio stations. And, and they're always expanding the, the range of conversation you can have. But typically, you don't really chat with these things. You give it commands. And today's program is one that I've heard about just because it's in the news, not because I'm an expert in artificial intelligence or, or follow um, that field very much, although I did take courses in it and was surrounded by people at, at MIT who, who, who did do that. Um, and today's program is called Chat GPT. And uh, any knowledge I have today was learned from Wikipedia and just poking around a little bit, preparing for the talk. And you could do the same. Um, the Wikipedia articles and the references are all pretty good. Um, it was launched as a prototype in November of 2022. Um, it has quite detailed responses and we'll be able to judge today whether you think its answers are articulate and are they accurate and knowledgeable. Um, but it says across many domains of knowledge. So today we might test it with its square dance calling knowledge. Um, and I posted, I had a little chat with it my first time I signed up and got an account. And I asked it, explain why square dancing is dying. That seems like a good thing. And this is the response. Now remember, this is from a computer program that hasn't been specifically programmed to know square dancing. And let's see what you think it, how you think it did. It says square dancing has been in decline in recent decades due to a number of factors. One major reason is that it's seen as an old fashioned activity that is not as relevant to modern society. Additionally, as people's lives have become more hectic and busy, they have less time to devote to hobbies and leisure activities. Furthermore, square dancing requires a certain level of physical ability and coordination, which can be challenging for some people, especially as they age. Finally, there's a lack of exposure and interest from the younger generation. So, I thought that's not a bad explanation. I didn't say how long to answer me for and all that, but that's what it did. So then I said, how do we get more people to try square dancing? This is a common, like this could be a interest session at Caller Lab or at your local square dance group or a square dance callers organization. And the chat GPT responded, there are several ways to get more people to try square dancing. Hosting community events and open houses where people can come and try square dancing for free. 
partnering with local organizations such as schools or senior centers to offer square dance classes, advertising and promoting square dancing through social media and local newspapers, offering beginner friendly classes and workshops to attract new dancers, reaching out to local square dance clubs and groups to collaborate on events and workshops, creating a welcoming and inclusive environment for people of all ages and backgrounds to participate. So again, I thought that was pretty good. I mean, that's better than what we often come up with at, at a color lab meeting. Now you could say you tried all these and you're still having problems, now what? But anyhow. So the next question I asked it is, apparently it can do poetry and short stories and all sorts of stuff. I said, write a square dance haiku. Now I'm no expert in haikus and I couldn't really tell you whether this meets the criteria of a haiku, but someone I read it to who knows haikus thought they liked it. And here's our haiku. Step in time, round, partner spin, hearts entwine, square dance, love found. Is that a good haiku or not? I don't know. How hard is it to call a square dance? I wanted to get into square dance calling since that's what we all do. It says, the difficulty of calling a square dance can vary depending on the caller's experience and skill level. Some callers may have years of experience and are able to lead, square dance with e lead a square dance with ease, while others may be new to the role and find it more challenging. Calling a square dance involves not only knowing the steps and calls for the dance, but also the ability to lead and guide the dancers through the dance. The caller must be able to communicate clearly and effectively and be able to adjust the pace and difficulty of the dance to suit the dancers. Additionally, callers need to have a good sense of timing, rhythm, and an understanding of music. It's also important to have a good understanding of the dancers' skill levels and to be able to adapt the calls to their abilities. Being able to read the dancers and adjust the calls on the fly is a key skill for a square dance caller. Overall, calling a square dance can be challenging, but with practice and experience, it can become easier. It's a skill that can be learned and honed over time. Again, in my mind, not a bad answer, um, but I'm beginning to notice a little bit of a pattern here, here in that it really knows how to kind of spit out three or four paragraphs and kind of have an initial opening paragraph and build a little bit and add another detail and kind of wrap it up at the end, like you might be told to do if you were writing, you know, this many words on a subject. But still, given that this is a computer program that doesn't know anything about square dancing or square dance calling, it seemed to know what calling was all about and stuff, and it picked up a bunch of points. So eh, maybe not so bad. What's your favorite square dance sequence? As an AI model, I don't have personal preferences or experiences. So I don't have a favorite square dance sequence. Square dance sequences can vary depending on the style and level of difficulty. And it's up to the dancers and callers preferences. Some callers may prefer traditional square dance sequences while others may prefer more modern contemporary sequences. Some dancers may enjoy more challenging sequences that require more complex footwork, while others may prefer simpler, more basic sequences. There is no right or wrong answer when it comes to square dance sequences. It's all about enjoying the dance and having fun. Well, it's beginning to give away its lack of knowledge a little bit here because we think of challenging sequences in terms of challenge square dancing is having complex choreography, not complex footwork. But anyhow, um, and it seems to acknowledge that there's traditional square dancing and modern, although it also called it contemporary, which may not be the word we would use. Okay, <clears throat> write a short square dance sequence. Here's a short square dance sequence. Head square through, four counts. I actually don't think that's right. I think square through is longer than four counts. 
Touch a quarter, two counts. Sounds good. Scoot back, four counts. Probably good. Swing through, four counts. Probably good. Boys run, four counts. And I didn't follow that in my head. Hold on. Touch a quarter, scoot back, swing through. So that's boy. The boys are not running from center to end, which is the normal direction we have them run. Bend the line. Not sure if that flows right and left grand. Um, that's just like a new caller who gets a little confused and like, uh, okay, right and left grand and promenade home. I guess we're all okay. So a little worried there. Um, maybe it doesn't know what it's doing. And then it actually wants to kind of cover itself. This is just one example of a square dance sequence and it's suitable for a beginner level. There are many different square dance sequences that can be used depending on the skill level of the dancers and the caller's preference. It's important to note that a sequence should be called by a square dance caller and the dancer should be familiar with the basic square dance calls. Okay, whatever. One or two more examples. Write a square dance sequence using chase right. Here's a short sequence using the call chase right. And you notice it chose to capitalize it and put it in quotes and everything. Head square through, four counts, seems to be back on its old pattern. Touch a quarter, go with what you know. Chase right. Well, we don't do chase right from there. That was ocean waves and chase right needs couples back to back. So not so good. Swing through, that's what it did before. Boys run, bend the line. Hey, right and left grand. So. It was just the previous sequence with Chase Wright arbitrarily inserted somewhere in there. And then it goes on to really explain that it doesn't know what it's doing. This sequence is an example of how the call Chase Wright can be incorporated into a square dance sequence. The call Chase Wright is a movement where the dancers move clockwise around the square, passing one another by the right side. It's a fairly common call and it's a great way to get the dancers moving around the square. As always, it's important to have a clear communication and to have the dancers familiar with the basic square dance calls. It's also important to have chat GPT familiar with the common square dance calls and it, apparently it isn't. Okay, and I'll conclude with this on the chat GPT side of the world. What will square dancing be like in 2050? It's difficult to predict exactly what square dancing will be like in 2050, as it depends on many factors such as societal trends, technology advances, and the evolution of the art form itself. However, it's likely that square dancing will continue to evolve and adapt to changing times. One possibility is that square dancing may become more technologically advanced with the use of virtual and augmented reality to enhance the dancing experience. Dancers may use virtual reality headsets to transport themselves to different locations or even different eras, and augmented reality could be used to enhance the visual effects of the dance floor. Because we all want to square dance on a disco floor. Another possibility is that square dancing may become more diverse and inclusive, reflecting the changing demographics of society. The calls and music may become more varied, drawing from different cultures and styles. I actually like this, although I gave a talk at Color Lab on diversity and inclusiveness, and number one, almost nobody came, and I don't think Color Lab members in general were very interested in more diverse and inclusive square dancing. If you gave them a choice between letting dancing die or only having older white people do it, I think in a lot of ways, the choice would be let's have only older white people do it. Just what I got out of that talk. Perhaps square dancing could become more popular, especially with the older generation, as it's a fun and social way to stay active and mentally sharp. It's also possible that square dancing will continue to evolve and change in ways that we can't predict today driven by the creativity and passion of dancers and callers. In any case, square dancing is an art form that has been adapting and changing for centuries, and it will likely continue to do so in the future. 
again, not so bad. Has a couple of germs of good ideas. Um, I don't know if score dancing is an art form that's been adapting and changing for centuries, maybe for 100 years or 150 years, but um, this seems a little grandiose. Um, we have several choices. We could stop here and play with this program in real time, or we could move on to um, the make it draw pictures. And I'm tempted to make it draw pictures because we've only used up 21 minutes and I think this will take another 10 and then we'll have a good half hour of um, playing with it. So hearing no objections, let's move on to a second piece of artificial intelligence software. And in their own words, we've trained a neural network, I haven't talked about what that is, called DAL E that creates images from text captions for a wide range of concepts expressible in natural language. So here's some commands you could give. You could say, I want an armchair in the shape of an avocado. I want a, a living room with two white armchairs and a painting of the Colosseum. The painting is mounted above a modern fireplace. Give me a professional high quality illustration of a giraffe turtle chimera, if I'm pronouncing that word correctly. That's kind of a mixture of two or three animals all stuck together. I want a snail made of a harp. And I want the exact same cat on the top as a sketch on the bottom. So show me a cat up here and the sketch of a cat. Now, a storefront that has the word OpenAI written on it. OpenAI is the company that's done all of what I've been talking about. A photo of food in China. So these are, this is examples of commands you can give from a paper that they've written, just showing you the wide range of what it can do. And we haven't talked about how any of this works, but it's gonna have been trained on a lot of pictures some of which have captions. And trust me, there's probably no picture or caption that this AI has ever seen that it's a combination of a giraffe and a turtle or a snail made of a harp. And it's amazing that it can do these things. Um, just to give you an example of these, let me show you that paper for a second. And um, then I'll show you the square dance ones. You are in my way. And we want to go here. Nope. We want to go here. So here are some of the pictures of a chair like an avocado. And I thought these were pretty cool. I mean, some of these chairs you might actually want to have in your in your living room. Some of them might be kind of uncomfortable to sit on. Here are the um, a living room with two white armchairs, a picture of the Colosseum above the fireplace, a modern fireplace. Um, it comes up with many pictures. Here's the turtle giraffe mixture. Here's the snail as a harp, a snail made of a harp. Some of those I think are kind of cool. Um, there's the cat and below it, a sketch of a cat. Remember, this is a computer AI who's never kind of done any of this doing this. One might wonder how it can do it. Here's a storefront with a sign open AI. And here's Chinese food or food from China. Um, so what did I ask it? I went through a series of pictures and I started with, uh, and I'm not good at spelling and it didn't matter that I'm not good at spelling. So I asked for an impressionist painting of a square dance. And then I modified that and asked for it to be in the style of Van Gogh. 
Then I asked for some pixel art of square dancing. And then I asked for happy square dancers in outer space. And then once I had the outer space idea, I changed it to happy square dancing aliens. And then an oil pastel drawing of happy square dancing aliens. And finally, I asked for square dancers and ocean waves. You ready for the results? Here we go. Um, if I go to here, this is my history. Oh, here's oil pastel drawing of happy square dancing aliens. Let's follow my arrows. There's another one. There's another one. Uh, here's square dancers and ocean waves. Not quite what we were looking for. Uh, let's get out of this for a second. I'm going to go down to the bottom. So here is an impressionist painting of a square dance. It's got the cowboy hat and the blue jeans. There's another one. There's the style of Van Gogh. There's another one, style of Van Gogh, and another one, and the last one. Let's see if I can move you guys out of the way and move the arrow in the other direction. So there's here's a third Impressionist square dance, and there's the fourth. Very different style. Notice that this style, same request, but it gives you a bunch of possible results. Okay, let's close that. I asked, I asked for pixel art. This is pixel art, what you might see on really old computers. That wasn't very interesting. I just wanted to know what it would do. Um, but then I asked for pixel art square dancing, I think. Here's a pixel art square dance. And there's another one. I didn't really like this, so I kind of gave up on it. Then I asked for happy square dancers in outer space. Um, I don't know what it was thinking. These guys look happy. They don't look like square dancers to me. They more look like um, Irish step dancers, happy Irish step dancers in outer space. But that's what I got. And then I got these beauties. I guess square dancing needs the boots. This comes closer. And finally this. And this kind of what is what made me think of aliens. So then we move into happy square dancing aliens. And these are some of my favorite. I actually like this one. Um, and there's this one. And here we have this one. This might be my favorite one. And this one. And then we moved on to the oil pastel drawings. We looked at these earlier. These I didn't like as much. I guess I didn't realize that pastels make oil pastels are more like kids' drawings or something, or something about the request made it seem like kids' drawings. And square dances and ocean waves, we have this one or this one. Or this one. And I have no idea where these guys are headed and why. They clearly. So um, at some point, I exceeded its ability because it clearly didn't know what we mean by ocean waves. And let's go back to the talk. Um, and we are done. I have a whole page of stuff we may want to discuss, um, but in the pre-talk time, I learned that a lot of you have tried this, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of discussion, and we may want to think about these things or want to hear more on any of these subjects during our discussion part. Um, 
is it intelligent? What is intelligence? We should talk about the Turing test in a very old program named ELISA and the ELISA effect. Um, we may want to know more about these things, machine learning, other machine learning like self-driving cars. At some level, if this is as good as it does on square dancing, do we really want self-driving cars to be taking us around and on our highways? Um, so at that point, I'm going to stop sharing and um, open it up and I can share again and um, we can, I have, I have a chat GPT or a picture drawing the, the dolly running so we can type in requests. So there we go. Wow, that's a good place to start. So I haven't played with it, Clark. I looked at your references, but I haven't played with it. Can you tell us how to sign in to each of these so that um, we can do it on our own when we're yeah. To um, later? I mean, basically, um, here. Uh, so unfortunately, let me screen share again. Is it a a, a mm, I would I would like anything this day and age. Um, you, I'm going to take a a risk here and create a um, new tab moment. I have too many tabs. And if you just typed into Google, chat GPT account, um, you could so you have to create do this. And you go to check this thing and log in and you can create an account for free and it will tell you how to do it. So just remember the hard thing is remember the word chat GPT and by Googling how to do what you wanna do, you will be pointed in the right direction. It's not hard. So when you create an account that's there, it's just letting you create an account. There's no- Right, at the moment, startup. all this is free. And here I am logged into my account um and oh as long as we're here i asked it to define the square dance call chase right just to prove to you that it doesn't know what it's talking about and it makes stuff up it's a square dance caller figure right chase right is a relatively simple call involves each dancer moving to the right around the square usually with the next dancer in line here's how the call might be executed the four dancers in a square start facing each other on the command Oops. like it's just making stuff up almost from a template of, you know, tell me how the call fiddledy foo works. And it, it'll, it would have done something like that too. I noticed so you've got to be careful. This is called hallucin uh, hallucinations. Like this program likes to hallucinate. It makes stuff up. I, I noticed on the first two square dance questions you asked it, it was pretty good. I agree. On the third one, on the third one it was starting to get pretty generic. Yep. Not quite as much as Eliza was, but starting to get there. And yeah, there's a pattern, but impressive. Um, does anybody else have generic questions or specific things to Clark? They want Clark to. Uh, yeah. Clark, did you Clark, did you ever bother to ask it to uh, define a call? It isn't really a call. See what it did. Oh, um, moment. Just like say, call what is scramble the eggs in square dancing or something like that. That's on C three B, isn't it? <laughs> um, just pick like scramble the eggs or something. I don't know. And let's just be nice to it and put that in quotes. Oh, I need to, I probably haven't, I'm probably logged out. Give me one sec. I also noticed that uh, you spelled the world aliens with an A in it, and it looks like it spit it back out. So it it can read misspelled words. And uh, once, once it uh, sees bad text, it just spits the bad text back, can't you? Uh, apparently, I mean, yeah, it corrects my spelling and stuff. So I thought that was nice. 
Well, no, it's aliens has got an E in it, not A L I A N S. So I just just wondered. I wondered if that was why it was picking up on the kind of kids notion of it. It's because of the misspelling. Interesting. Yeah. I got a couple of hands up, so let me know when you got this done. Okay, Claire. here's your scramble the egg coming out. Ah, change places in a fast, chaotic manner. I love that. Scramble. There you go. Well, actually, so, uh, if I ever get to a call, if I ever get called that, we'll do it. Can you read it, Clark? Because I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Scramble the egg is a square dance call that is used to describe a specific dance movement in square dance. In square dancing, the scramble the egg call is typically used to have the dancers change places in a fast and chaotic manner, similar to scrambling eggs in a frying pan. The exact movement may vary depending on the caller and style of square dancing being performed but it typically involves dancers quickly and chaotically crossing over and under one another to change positions. The scramble the egg call is often used in fast paced square dance sequences and is a favorite among many dancers. I think callers used to call that Chinese fire drill. But yeah, I'm... Chinese fire drill, right. So Ferris wheel is a square dance call used in square dancing to describe a specific dance movement. In a Ferris wheel, the dancers in a square dance formation form two concentric circles and rotate around each other in opposite directions, similar to the movement of a Ferris wheel ride in an amusement park. In a typical Ferris wheel, one circle of dancers moves in one direction while the other circle moves in the opposite direction. Dancers in each circle hold hands and rotate around each other, sometimes switching places with the dancer on the opposite side of the circle. The Ferris wheel can be performed in a variety of ways and at varying speeds, depending on the caller and style of square dance being performed. The Ferris wheel is a staple of many square dance routines and is a popular call among square dancers. It is considered a fun and challenging movement that requires coordination and precise timing between the dancers. I mean, I've seen it executed that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Makes making stuff up. Yep. I've I've that actually I have used something very similar in, in party nights where heads <laughs> promenade all the way around while the sides come in and circle to the left. Um it gives a nice effect and dancers like it, but but it doesn't have a name. Maybe I'll have to what do we call it? Alternate Ferris wheel, fake Ferris wheel. Anyway, yeah. um, Stephen, you the, old the, old, the old traditional dance, Solomon Levi does that with the boys going one direction, the girls going the other direction. They should do two couples, the other two couples, then four, four, four couples do the move. It's the definition of that. <laughs> Interesting. Stephen, your hands uh -huh. up. I noticed it's it's gonna have to push its checkers a little bit more to get uh, flowing calls. Yeah, that that first sample had head square through, touch a quarter, scoot back, swing through. The swing through is gonna be tough enough to do. Yep. And then after that, it had boys run, which they can't really do because the boys have right hands. Oh, it's boy, boy, girl, girl. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't know that. Yep. So <laughs> it's got some learning to do. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't really say how it does all this, but at some level, it's been fed a whole lot of text examples, like maybe everything in Wikipedia and everything on a lot of web pages. And it synthesized how we put together sentences in English and how we can write a paragraph and, and so forth. But it doesn't have anything like SD hooked up behind the scenes. You know, maybe if you took this plus SD, it could actually be, you know, a square dance assistant or something. 
but it doesn't have that kind of intelligence. Larry? Muted. Muted. Yeah, sorry, the mute button was off screen because I had scooted the window over. Uh, <laughs> first of all, this isn't uh, that important, but there, but uh, scramble the egg is a call. <laughs> As is eggs circulate. Let's see, Bill Davis created all that. Flip uh. the egg, cut the egg, switch to an egg. Uh, there's an egg formation. There's sausage formations as well. Uh, but that's, you know, so um, so that is a real thing. I was going to say, when I was playing with the software this morning, um, a few things surprised me. Like I, like I asked it if it, um, if it knew what an EOL formation was. Um, I don't know if you guys know what that is. Uh, and it gave, it gave me like a half truth answer like it had some of it right and some of it was just gibberish okay but what it's really good at is if you type in let me just look at it so i read it correctly i typed in explain why square dancing is so popular and it did a really good job on that so 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 there's you know i didn't type in uh what's wrong with square dancing i just i pretended like it was the greatest thing since sliced bread on all my questions and it gave, uh, you know, so it's gonna be really good at uh, creating some content for a website, uh, you know, about the benefits of square dancing, things like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, not so much with a uh, choreography. <laughs> yeah. I, I noticed Clark in the diagrams the many of them had six dancers instead of eight. Yeah, I think you're right. And I'm going to use those uh, aliens ones for on my posters. So, yeah, <laughs> I like that vibe. Oh, Clark, yeah. I was wondering on. Let's. Hmm. I can't remember a specific question you asked that I was interested in, but if you ask it the same question again, will it give the same answer or a parallel one? Like the run, write a square dance sequence. Uh, well, I haven't asked it that. Um, yeah, I just said write a short square dance sequence. Element, no, this is completely different. <laughs> and it's funny, this one. Is... I was going to say, couldn't the people that, that write the SD software incorporate a tool like this uh, into the software? I think. Yeah, it... well, that's an interesting question. Um, in. Um, when people, I mean, clearly behind the scenes, this has a, this is a pretty big complicated program. And what kind of interfaces do you want to make available into it? So-called API application programming interfaces. And I'm not sure, you know, what they make available. Um, I do know that this technology, and this is not just the open AI company has has come up with this it ends up a bunch of companies were working on similar things and this is the you know nth generation of of efforts and other places my understanding have similar or maybe even better or slightly different programs but their management was afraid to make it available for free and let it out in the wild in the world like this one has been so chat GPT is getting all the news and, um, and all the accolades and other programmers and developers are feeling a little bit having been given the short shrift because they already knew this. We did this, you know, months and years ago, but we weren't allowed to talk about it or do anything. The Microsoft 
which is, has been losing with its Bing editor, its Bing um, search engine uh, compared to Google is believing that this technology might be the new way to do search. So instead of Googling for something the way Google works, you'll just be talking to a chat GPT and it will be coming up with stuff. So it'll be interesting to see whether that makes it or is not what people really want. You said that this is currently free. Is, well, Correct. That, John, I miss it, your hand up. That it's currently free. Are they expecting, are we expecting them to charge for it later? Um, I think that if they started charging a lot, um, I noticed there's a button on my screen called upgrade to plus that says new. So, you know, I'm sure that everyone wants to monetize everything, but if there's too much competition out there, other people will offer their their chat bot for free. So I don't know what's going to really happen. Um, and, and chat bot is the generic term versus open AIs. Uh, chat GPT. Yeah, I think you would call this a chat bot. Traditionally, chat bots have maybe been used for specific purposes, whereas this is a more general one. But I, I think you could call it a chat bot. John, your hands up. Yeah, I was just wondering um, if you put, if you tried to ask it a polar opposite question, like ask it, uh, why is dying good for me? And then ask it, why is dying bad for me? And see what it says. Um, I'm going to make my screen a little bigger if I'm lucky so people can read this. Uh, let me scroll it back just a little bit. There we go. So there, without me reading it all out loud, um, it gave us three, three, par three sentences or three paragraphs with a sentence or two each on it. Now type in the other one. Why is dying bad for me? See what it does. I'll put a question mark at the end to be nice to it. Huh. I think it gummed it up. Oops. Yeah. Is this arrow important? Here we go. It wasn't scrolling. So that seems relatively accurate. Yeah. I was just wondering, does this, does this thing think for itself or does it just have, it knows, like I said, it, it knows every word that you put in that a definition. Is it actually thinking or is it just trying to relate them all to each other and spit out an answer with a lot of fluff words? Um. Yeah, that's kind of the question. Is Clark actually thinking or is he just spitting words out, fluff words? Yeah, out? <laughs> um, so that let's, let's just say, I mean, um, when we were talking before the talk started, uh, I mean, Chris, Chris Stacy had had some comments in that area. Are you, are you talkable right now, Chris? Maybe not, um, but I mean, Chris's view is it's just been programmed with millions or billions of sentences and phrases, and it's it picks and chooses among it and comes up with its answer, but that it doesn't have an understanding in any sense that we might think of understanding of what it's doing and how it's doing it. Um, this gets back to some questions that have come up when people first started saying, let's create machines that think, or let's create artificial intelligence. And how can you tell whether something's intelligent or not? 
let me just slip to this for a second. Um, I want to go here. Um, Alan Turing um, in the 50s created something that he called the imitation game or the Turing test. And my understanding is initially <clears throat> it consisted of three people. Um, there would be a man um, kind of on one keyboard, a woman on a second keyboard, and the person who's asking the questions, say me. And I could type questions to each of the two people, the man or the woman. And after a certain period of time, I would have to decide which one is a man and which one is a woman. And the Turing test would be to replace one of the men or women uh, typing with a computer. And if the person who's doing the questioning can't figure out which is the man and the woman, or which one of them is, is actually imitating a man or a woman, then that would be intelligent. It's since been changed in general, just to think of it, if I had you typing and chatting with somebody on a computer chat, and you couldn't figure out whether it is a human or a computer, then wouldn't that be intelligence? I'll leave it at that for now. But if you Google the Turing test, there's a huge long page and people have done experiments with this even in the 90s or, or, or aughts. And in some of the experiments, when I show people, not I, when, when uh, researchers show other researchers transcripts of chats with, are they human or are they computer? Um, sometimes the the amount of trickery or ability to get it right is only in the 50 or 55 percent range which means that computers have gotten pretty good at making people think that they are human as opposed to computer anybody Darryl, else daryl's got his hand up awesome He's also got his hand over his mouth. You're muted. Okay. I, sometimes, never mind. Uh, you may have answered my question, uh, which would have been, is it self-generating? Uh, meaning, is if I ask a question uh, in different ways, is it going to become more intelligent uh, as we go? And if so, uh, being free, uh, thinking of all the millions of people that might be answer, uh, asking and getting answers for those questions. Is it going to self-generate? Um, so I guess uh, one way of, of saying is, does it learn? Is it getting smarter in some sense? Um, because certainly one of the holy grails of artificial intelligence and machine learning is that hey, maybe we can make a machine and it's a little dumb at first, but over time it learns and learns and learns just like humans do. And then no matter how bad it is when it starts out, it will eventually get to a good place. Um, I believe that chat GPT has been programmed once and for all on a set of phrases, words, documents, knowledge. It says, don't ask me questions of after you know, 2021 or something, because that's when they grabbed the database and started doing its stuff. So it may not know about current events. Like we couldn't ask it about the, the Chinese balloon, for example. But um, it when it does give an answer, the people who let you do these, um, use it for free, will ask you, was this a suitable response or or is this a bad response to your question or to your thing? And if you tell it that it's not very good, they will tweak the programming or tweak the parameters to try to make it better. So in that sense, I think there is a little bit of learning going on, but I'm not sure that there's so much, like they're definitely trying to reduce the, um, the fever dream responses that it sometimes gives. Um, 
but I'm not concerned about it becoming really smart like in the next year or two. Maybe over 10 or 20 years, I don't know. Buck, I have a question for you to ask it. Um, yes, let me bring I'm it reminded, up. I'm Go. reminded because of the people we have here, but ask it what countries square dancing is popular in. In whatever words you think it needs to hear, whatever wording. I'll phrase it with your dangling preposition. Yeah. United States, Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, Germany, and many other countries, Japan, France, New Zealand. So reasonably accurate. My apologies mm -hmm. to the people in Sweden here if they feel left out. But. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's it doesn't have any that are where it's not popular at this point. Right. Um, Although but, it's, it's picking mostly English speaking countries, except for Germany. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would argue that, you know, it, it's doing something that I see, like, look at what it's doing. It's especially popular here. It's widely enjoyed here. It's well established here. It has a growing following here and a strong following. I think it kind of found five or six points and it wants to use a different way to, to put each of those in. And if we were anticipating or, or taking some knowledge from, you know, is it really growing in United Kingdom and well established in Australia? I think that's false. Um, but it doesn't know that. So it it came up with prose that reads well, but I think is slightly inaccurate. So I have a question for everybody. Um, let's come up with some questions, not to check on how good it is, but are there things that we can do, we can ask it that can be useful for us with the degree of knowledge it has now? Um, Dan, for instance, likes the uh, <laughs> one of the the alien drawings for his posters. Um, well, can we get it to ask us a question? Can Jet? Can we get Jet I'm, GPT to ask us a question? No, I'm asking Please. you guys. I'm asking you guys and gals. Are there some questions? Are there some ways that you can conceive of getting good enough answers that will help us? rather than just trying to judge how looking for the flaws in it. Yeah, it looks like it's just a bunch of fluff here. It just spits back out your words and different uh, different other different combinations. Well, that's I'm kind of agreeing with you, John. I'm just wondering if there's some ways we can use it. Ask it to see if you can define Pick, pick a phrase or something. Ask how many how many different ways it can define a phrase or something like that. See how many see if it will give it all its different combinations. Like what is square dancing? How many how many different ways do you know how to how to define square dancing? You want me to ask it what is square dancing? Well, yeah, or how many different ways it can define square dancing. That'll give us an idea of how many different ways it'll look at or regurgitate the word square dancing. I, I like some of the, your original questions, Clark, about using it to come up with, with verbiage to how do we get people in, for flyers, for posters, yeah. how do we get people interested? Social dance form performed by four couples arranged in a square formation, a type of folk dance that originated in the United States and is characterized by its calls and formations. A form of dance that involves a combination of folk and ballroom elements and is performed by couples. A dance style that involves intricate footwork and patterns. No, that's what we don't have. Set to music and called by a caller. 
Oh, there's our country or folk music. Each of these definitions highlights different aspects of square dancing. They all capture its essence as a dynamic and engaging dance form that is enjoyed by people of all ages and backgrounds. Now, answer number four was the first time in any of this thing over the last exactly an hour that it mentioned music. It's never mentioned music before, to, to my knowledge, which is, I thought, an integral part and important part of what we've got. Um, seeing as it is the hour, let's do the traditional. <laughs> uh, Clark, if you stop sh sharing your screen for just a moment. Um, I will. Well, I was no, just asking it what you do at 12 o'clock. <laughs> and I need to provide more context or information about who Don Beck is. Um, <laughs> to assist you better. Oh, geez, it, it doesn't know who I am. I'm No, I'm, sorry. It didn't know so, who Chris was either. <laughs> so, so we did it. We, we have session number 103 or something like that. I said we were gonna be intermittent. I wasn't planning to be as intermittent as we were, but I do have a few more people I'm gonna correspond to. Of course, other things get in the way like life, but I think it's great that we're back here and we have a, a good showing. And um, so thank you guys for coming. My apologies for not putting the link in the time in the email that I sent to a bunch of people. Um, let's have a round of applause for our presenter, making us, me, more aware Thank of you. what all this stuff is, Clark. Thank you. Um, it was a, as you said to me, it may be a timely time to to present this stuff because some of it has been going on the on the Square Dance mailing list, Rich Real Square Dance mailing list. Um, very interesting, and I suspect many of us are going to have fun playing with this. <laughs> Notice I don't say using it, I say playing with it, <laughs> because that's, I think, the stage it's at so far. But thank you, Clark. Thank you, guys. And with that, let's continue on if people are interested in more thoughts and comments. So CC has a good point about why ask it questions when you know it's just going to give you BS answers. And I think that people uh, who think this is going to change work as it stands right now are telling on themselves about what they do for work. But I, I have seen some interesting things about using this to expand search results, like um, the Orange Fall, uh, Orange Fall holiday mapping to Halloween in uh, ways to, to query local databases kind of is a is a result that looked interesting and I want to pursue a little bit more. That's I listen, the programming stuff. I listened to several computer related podcasts and they've been talking about this and they've said, you know, I'm about to, when I'm about to write a program to do such and such, um, I ask it to write the program for me and tell me, tell them the language I want it written in. And they say it comes out with a pretty darn good place to start. It doesn't do a good thing, a total thing, but it gives me an idea of the approach, you know, 85, 90%, and I just have to get in there and tweak it. So some people are using it for good things. But I, I like your question, Cece, about why are we asking you questions if we know it's going to be fluff? And that was my question. What, what type of questions can we ask it? that we will be able to use the output from like how like clark said how do we attract more people um to our fun activity um alan and unmute yourself before you talk hey there um i heard a very interesting uh program about a woman who is a professional writer who uh, use chat GBT. One thing she hadn't written about was the death of a traumatic death of her sister. And she started talking about it to chat GBT and added more and more information. And it was fascinating what it came up with. It started describing not a eulogy, but talking about her sister and talking about, uh, 
not of things that had happened, but things that could have happened based on the woman's description of her sister. And so that idea of using it sort of as something not not to create a product, but to process things. And it was it was really fascinating. Uh, so I think it's what's really important is how are you going to use this, right? And I think we don't know all the ways that it can be used yet. Um, and that was a place where you were not, it, it's not like it was a uh, uh, an oracle that had all this information about stuff in the world. It was just something that knew about natural language and how to converse. So I, I think it's a very interesting, uh, uh, um, it's an interesting thing. That's that sounds like a really good use, Alan. Uh, my podcast people were also talking about um, about that high school and college kids are using these to write essays, and so the next step is that people are developing programs for teachers to check essays to make sure they weren't written by bots. Um, I'm not sure how they do that. If I did, I guess I'd be in the business of writing them, but um, it sounds like, again, the next step up. So one thing that um, uh, I bought my mom, who was in her 90s, a... Uh, um, Alex device. And she was never very good at using it because she always wanted to be a little more conversational with it than just give it a, the wake up name and, you know, what's the temperature out or play me some music or whatever. And it was clear to me that having something that she could talk to and would converse back and forth a bit and follow a conversation and seem to understand stuff might have been a useful device. But that wasn't what the Alex device is. Um, and there was kind of a program like that, if I can bring up Eliza for a sec, which was developed in the late 60s. Um, and it tried to imitate a, uh, certain therapist. form of psychologist or psychiatrist and it didn't have any language understanding at all other than it could parse a sentence and pick out a few words so you might start off and going i feel sad today and it would say why do you feel sad today and you'd go well you know i woke up late and this and this and and it would find a couple of words or phrases and it would kind of keep getting you talking and at Tell some me more point about getting up late. It yeah, was, it would it would loop back and go earlier. You said that you felt sad. So if it kind of hit a dead end, it would go earlier. You said bump and try to. And there's. There's a, the guy who wrote it knew that it had no intelligence and was just stupid, but he was amazed at the number of people who. Gave it the benefit of human intelligence and so forth and thought it knew and could do a lot more. Oh, it really understands me. And something like the chat GPT that we saw today is like a million times better than what Eliza did. And if you tilted it in a certain area where its goal was to have an older individual who's lonely have something to talk to, I think you could have that as a product. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? Like, isn't it a sad thing to have an older adult pouring their feelings and dreams and concerns into a non-sentient being? That might be a really bad thing. Um, but on the other hand, if there's no one around to talk with this person, maybe it's a good thing. So. I could see there being a use for something like that. I just want to point out uh, when we talk about Eliza, it, it reminds me of an incident that I, I really laughed at. It was 
I, my wife, who is a clinical psychologist, and she and a colleague of hers were both around the computer, and I showed them Eliza and then watched them ask it quest, ask her questions, um, leading questions, obviously, because they were in the field. And the two of them laughing at the responses was very entertaining to me. But uh, in fact, I spent time chatting with her once, in, Eliza, once in a while. Um, Clark, I also want to mention that you don't talk about the Amazon lady by name. You call her Alex. I can't do that because my son's name is Alex also. And if I ask Alex to do something, he, he won't. So we just ref generally refer to her as, as Ms. A or Miss oh, Ms. Ms. A. Ms. A. That's good. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm hogging the conversation here. Any other thoughts? I see some smiles. <laughs> I see somebody waving goodbye. Yes. Uh, later, folks. Nice job, Clark. Uh, very informative. I, I had no idea that anything like that was going on. Of course, being a dinosaur, that could be expected. Have a good one, everybody. Bye -bye. Take care. Let me say, I'm going to get this quote wrong, but it's close. it's close to right. Um, the world we live in today, we've experienced a lot of change. Change, things are changing faster today than they ever have in the past. And we all experience that. And as we're older, sometimes we don't like change, et cetera. But the second part of that thing, that phrase, so things are changing faster today than they ever have before. Things will never change as slow as they are today. That's the scary thing. The rate of change is gonna keep accelerating. We're gonna look back to today is like, no, things weren't changing very fast. And yet look at the cell phone, the supercomputer we carry in our pocket, you know, in fact, the reason AI is able to do what we, what we saw today is because the speed of computers have gotten as fast as they have. We couldn't have done what you saw today back in the 1970s, 80s, or 90s. Try as those guys might have doing AI research. They couldn't kind of couldn't get anywhere with this except with this kind of stuff. I, 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 what I see a danger of is so with this, um, people that don't know better might take the information that it's giving them as gospel and think it's really the truth. And, and if the AI program itself, you know, you, we have hackers everywhere. What if hackers are, get, get into the AI system and input things and people are taking all that, that information and counting it as truth? And it's actually not the truth or, or not factual. Yeah. Or, or what if the programmers behind it could say, work just the way you do, but I want to tilt all the answers towards some direction, nefarious direction, let's just say. Yes. Exactly. Uh, and yeah. for ex right now in government, um, there might be a proposal to, we want to build a new bridge here. We want to rezone the town a certain way or whatever. And it's open to um, community discussion. What if much of the community discussion that's sent in is people asking chatbots to come up, tell me why, uh, why uh, changing the zoning in this direction is a bad idea. And you just have a hundred or a thousand people all do that and send those in as their real comments, even though the mm -hmm. comments were created by an AI. Well, we don't need AI to give us what, you know, you said people believe that as truth, but even in today's society, you can talk to people and they think it's the truth, but they're far from the truth. So AI doesn't change any of that. You have people that lie or give, give false statements today. Correct. Right. But, but there's, there's the human element behind that. And if you take I don't know. It just it just seems like it could perpetuate it faster. I guess is my. We've already 
I I got involved in the uh, internet fairly early and have kind of watched the decline of everything being overcome by websites that are spewing out bullshit in order to try to attract Google hits. And when we automate that, I think we accelerate the race to the bottom. I'm just curious, Dan, you do a lot in local politics, whether you can use some of the chatbot stuff to influence the people you're talking to. And before you answer that, I'm CC, you do a lot with homeschooling. And I'm wondering if there's ways that you could use that to help you rather than lead you astray. But Dan, go ahead first. Um, one of the things that has been proposed is that so drop back to a little story. I joined Pixar shortly before uh, Toy Story came out, which means that nobody had heard of Pixar yet. And so when Toy Story came out, the uh, internal email list was just full of like, hey, I found this review in this local paper and this review in this local paper. And they were all essentially the same press packet rewritten to introduce errors and uh, and falsehoods and typos by local reporters for whatever val value of reporting that means. And I've, as I look at what kind of local reporting is around here, there are a lot of people who are, you know, a lot of people, reporters kind of sit through the, the public comment or the, the public meetings and then write something that sure isn't what I took away from that public meeting when I come back from it. So I don't know if ChatGPT can somehow do that summarization better than the local political reporters have been doing it, then maybe that would be valuable. I mean, there's a lot of technology chains in there. And I think that I've been thinking a lot about the, the publishers of the local papers are obviously beholden to advertisers. So if this becomes a way of having an entity that does that summarization and all that hard work rather than staying up till midnight 30 watching a really frankly boring planning commission meeting um, that something beholden to us rather than beholden to the advertisers then maybe there's value there I don't know there's I'm still very skeptical about the future and think that this is mostly bad uh, Janet I see your hands up but hold on for a second because I have See, I asked Cece a question. I'm curious if she's willing to answer it. Um, I I don't know as far as homeschooling goes. I I I understand like with kids, you know, kids always look for ways to cheat, not have to do the work. That's always uh, a possibility. It's a matter of character. Doesn't matter whether it's a kid or somebody working a business. Uh, you know, it. it I don't know how I haven't thought about this enough. I didn't even know what the topic was today. <laughs> so um, I just, I was like, Ooh, I actually have time this morning. So I'm here. Um, I, and I, I haven't had time to think about how it would apply to schooling um, other than what you mentioned. I think Clark and when he and I were talking in, on the phone a few days ago mentioned that you could say, write an article about, such and such and then you could say write an article about the same thing but at a fourth grade reading level and then at a second grade reading level um am i correct that you were saying that clark and i think you can do the reading level and my friend tried it and said you know write in spanish how to do this and it actually did it in spanish and his wife is a native spanish speaker so he thought that was pretty cool. So maybe he can have it write a Valentine to his wife in Spanish. Yeah. So yeah, so I uh, I played with it this morning because my wife's a middle school teacher. And so uh, I had it write out some uh, complicated things and then I had it rewrite it uh, for 13 year old reading level and it, it would do that. So, CC, so would... that's where that's where the teacher um, you know, if you're watching your student in, in class, that's where the teacher would understand the tone of the individual student. Now, that's really hard to do when you have 120 students, you know, throughout the day. But 
as, as far as homeschooling, I'd know if my kid was using something because I know how she normally writes, you know, um, you know, when you have six students, you can, you can, you have more of a feel and, and, and can sense when that where the artificial intelligence to pick it up might know what her normal writing style would be. But yeah, there's already, there's already been, there's already software uh, that purports to being able to uh, determine if it's been created this way. Well, as a homeschool parent who homeschooled her child throughout her entire life, I'm gonna give my two cents on the homeschool aspect. And in the homeschool realm, you run everything from what I will call responsible parents who really have the child's best interest at heart and give them the best education. Those people would probably want nothing to do with AI because it you want the child to think for themselves, do things for themselves, that type of thing. But then on the other aspect, I've seen uh, parents on the other end of the spectrum that would advocate for that because it allows the creativity and, and that type of thing. It's, I don't see it as a plus or a negative. It's kind of a neutral ground right now. But just like a, a college professor, my, my brother is a college professor and he can catch the kids cheating on his math test. Well, there's all kinds of online calculators and stuff that can give you those answers, but it has to do with when they have to write their answers out and stuff. Because if one kid writes and puts a hard return in there and sends it to somebody else, it's gonna show up as a hard return. So you've got grammatical errors in there. and when two or three kids have the same grammatical errors, guess what? They, they, you know, coerced and work together on projects and stuff. So it all comes down to the educator being aware that this stuff exists. But like Cece said, a parent is going to know how their child learns and how they normally write. And I don't think a child who is really enjoying their schooling education would even want to cheat because that only lessens their education. Um, most of them don't want to take shortcuts, at least if they're, if they've been brought up right. Well, what I was thinking of as again, using it positively, um, is saying, trying to teach your kid a difference, tell the chat bot, tell me about, or write about a, um, purple rabbit in as a fourth grade reading level. And then you tell it, write about a purple rabbit in a 13th, 12th grade reading level. And then you can take these two with your kid and analyze so they can see, you know, assuming they're at an age where they can see the difference and show them what it looks like, the difference between one and another and teach them different writing styles as a result of it. Well, what we did, I, you don't need AI to do that. What I would do is um, have my daughter look through the newspaper and she would find all the grammatical errors in the newspaper. Um, and you could get two and three different newspapers and compare the, the slant on the articles. So that's, you know. There was no way I could homeschool. I could have home taught, but the best way to get through to my kid is not to say a word and let him discover it. I've uh, heard the kind of tools that statistically try to figure out if this is a auto-generated text or not. And one thing to be careful of is false positive rates are such that if you've got 10 kids, uh, you know, playing by the rules and one kid cheating and your test is 70% accurate, most of the people who, most of the those flagged as cheaters are actually going to be playing by the rules. So there are an awful lot of assumptions that we make that are wrong in trying to automate and statistically understand how these things are impacting. That's, that's, I can see that happening. That's very interesting. So for a bunch of the examples I had right off the bat, you know, asking it to tell me why people enjoy square dancing or where square dancing is going to be in 2050 or any of those things, where it did an acceptable job maybe of coming up with some stuff. How often are we in our lives asked to produce stuff like that? And if that isn't a skill that we have and do and use very often, why isn't this just another 
calculator and we're just bemoaning the fact that kids can't do math manually and they all need to use a calculator or they can't look stuff up in books, they just use Google. Um, other than the error rate of this, like the fact that it, it actually can really lie to you, which, which I think is a pretty big drawback. So, so I have to caveat that, but. Well, I think it has to do with dumbing down society. Right, and I think everyone's always felt like every generation feels that society has been dumbed down compared to the previous generation. Isn't that just another, I used to go to school uphill both ways, you know, in the snow? I, you know, I'm wondering, I, I never thought deeply about should kids be using calculators and Googles and all that. But I took a course in college as a mechanical engineer called gadgeteering, where they taught us how a typewriter works and how a sewing machine works. and at the time how punch cards work for for computers and punch card readers and basic gadgets with the intention of saying these have been invented already you should take don't reinvent the wheel take the wheel and work with it and so thinking about it now the calculator has been invented and google has been invented maybe our kids should use those as a baseline which they do anyway um and take it the next step going further. Um, just a thought. Has anybody, Clark, used this for creating music? Don't know. I don't think so. But we can create poetry, bad poetry. I mean, you saw the haiku. I asked it to do a longer poem. And someone tried to use it to create lyrics to songs um in the style of a certain uh recording artist and his comment about it is it takes him you know blood sweat and tears um and real emotion and whatever to create the lyrics of his songs and looking at what the the ai created um to him this is a bunch of crap and and this is hopeless and has nothing to do with creating real song lyrics that that'd be interesting. He was pretty appalled. You know, ask it to um, to what write lyrics about gardening to this melody of singing in the rain. Yeah, uh, it'd be entertaining. Uh, I see Joe up in the corner, and Alan next. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There there has been uh, artificial intelligence writing music, but. It, it's um, it's just the same as uh, the communication aspect. It knows the rules, and it can create technically log you know um, logical music, but it does not have the the uh, human the sentient part uh, of feelings. Uh, so it doesn't create uh, necessarily nice music. Um, it's correct. You, you know, it's very Bach. Uh, sounding for the most part, uh, you can do a few things with it, but uh, it's the same thing with the artificial intelligence situation. You, you're lacking in the communications. You're lacking the uh, the uh, tone of voice and the body language, and without that, you won't have complete communication anyhow. I would uh, pipe in that one place where machine learning has been used very effectively in music. Is there a bunch of tools now which can extract the vocal or break down the recording tracks into their components? Not incredibly, but well enough that they're usable, say, to remove the vocals from a track to use it as background music for square dance calling. Um, so there's there are applications. And the opposite one of that that I studied in college was if you had an old recording of Caruso you could re separate the voice from the music and then re-record the music without all the noise and scratches, but still have his voice going to it, so. I'm trying a different version of <laughs> artificial stuff at this point. I see it's entertaining. Yeah, Alan? Yeah, so my question um, is about, we're talking about the creative process, right? 
And when I think about AI and square dancing, where I go to is uh, basically uh, choreography generation. Yes. And so what I'm not as familiar with some of the tools that are out there, the existing calling tools, but do some of them have like VIX stuff? Does it say, okay, generate a sequence that had, like you said, that has Chase Wright in it or um, <laughs> the Easter Bunny's here. Um, uh, I'm referencing Dan, not what I was talking about. So um, yeah, so that's always an interest to me. I mean, I have, I have, having re having uh, recently turned 65 and looking at retirement, one of my projects that I want to look at is the idea of virtual square dancing, which could involve anything from, uh, you know, could be useful for callers to have like a virtual square to call to, or if I'm, if I don't have a full class around me that I could, you know, I could participate and learn and learn with real people around me and things like that. But one of the components of that would be actually some call, you know, some choreography stuff. So, you know, uh, let's do a C1 tip uh, in the style of Clark Baker. Right. So here's an idea I've had on that. And unfortunately, um, I haven't and probably will never implement this. But my belief is if I had all the material I've ever written and all the material Vic's called and, and other callers and this day and age, like it'd be great if you could get it by recording someone's dances and actually just having the computer pull out the square dance choreography from it. But I don't know how to do that either. But somehow if I had transcripts from many callers or you know the top 10 um, challenge callers at, at different, from different dances at different dance programs. I believe I could generate new material that sounded like Vic um, by one, you need a program like SD that can do the stuff. But two, I think you only need kind of like pairwise combinations of after this call, Vic typically follows it with this, and then this is this. So I think if I had pairwise frequencies or maybe three calls in a row frequencies and extracted that from all of Vic's writing, I could then generate more material that sounded like Vic. And Clark's and, been talking about this. And you this have to make 40. the sequences be the right length. Clark's been talking about this for 40 years now. I remember right. you're talking about that a long time ago. Yes. But I've never done it. I'm interested. I might ping you on it. Mm -hmm. um, what, Alan, a long time ago, I wrote a very crude square dance calling program. Not calling, but, you know, you could type in and, and see your choreography and check it. But it had the ability, one, to generate random choreography that was possible and to verbalize what it was calling. So it actually called sequences and recognized Alaman left to right and left brands. It had no idea, and I, I, hopefully I can find the video of a group of four squares that was dancing to it once. It had no idea about difficulty, about interest, about body flow and what have you. Um, but this was 30, 40 years, 40 or 50 years ago that I did it. Um, you know, it might call three U-turn backs in a row. It's possible, but it was no, wasn't great. So yeah, it it could be done to some extent. And then you could use Clark's resolve tables to, to resolve with interesting things. And I, I bring up Clark's resolve tables because I think somebody mentioned them a few weeks back or a few sessions back in one of the groups. Uh, no, it was like a, several months ago. Um, and stuff has happened since then. Clark, you wanna tell briefly what a resolve table is, Clark, and then I'll tell the current status. So you've pushed your checkers around because you're writing material and um, you've gotten them somewhere 
And instead of looking at the square and using your own resolving abilities to do, um, you know, pass through wheel and deal, center swing through, turn through element left, whatever it is, you just type that or you look that position up on one piece of paper and it ends up for, from say right-hand waves, there are 384 different right-hand waves that symmetric dancers can be in. But if you divide that by four, because you don't really care whether it's one man or two man or three man, four man, et cetera, there's 96 different ones. So you look them up and you end up with a number between one and 96. And then you turn to the right piece of paper that says, I want it in advanced resolution. And you look up that number and it shows you 10 computer generated resolutions from that position. Now, not all of them, they were computer generated. Not all of them have good flow or hands and it doesn't even know what your last call into those ocean waves were. But that's how I resolved a lot of my material. And, and at least it's usually one, two or three calls. So it's not very long. And some of them are interesting. At the challenge level, it might be flip chain through cross reactivate and promenade home. And as a caller, you would never have known that flip chain through cross reactivate would be the resolution from there. As people started using it more and more, these clever, fancy, big call at the end and suddenly you're into a right and left grand became popular because everyone was using the resolve tables. And then people knew, oh, that was done with a resolve table. But anyhow. There, and there's a list for advanced get outs for C1, for C2, for C3. It wasn't broken into C3A and B at the time, C4. Um, I think it was 1986 that it said at the top. Anyway, some people said, well, can I get a copy of these? And I checked with Clark and he no longer had a copy. And Ed Foote was in this conversation and Ed said he had a hard copy and he would send it. Ed sent me the hard copy. I scanned it. I OCR'd it. I got Clark's permission. And I'm in the process of uploading, of transferring these to Barry Clasper, who will be putting them in the Carl Lab knowledge base. Um, and we will announce at the time that it's out there. I just have been too busy with the new computer to, to find Barry's Dropbox folder to stick it into. But um, it's in the process. That's why I brought it up now, because even though it's outdated, oh, I just looked at the screen. It's still my avatar talking. Even though it's outdated, um, it will be available again soon and probably has some value to some people. Let me see if I can get the other Don Beck to show up. Uh, window. He's gone. Yeah, I guess he is. I can't seem to find he's left the building <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm just i'm just sitting in here filling in for him where did that go the window that used to give me a chance to change that will the oh. real dog oh. back stand up <laughs> <laughs> something we haven't talked about much is the art aspect what about dolly and the art it can generate um in a sense, that doesn't have the same problem with what's fiction and what's fact. It's more like we need art for lots of stuff. And, you know, if I were developing a board game and needed art on a deck of cards and needed 30 different drawings in a certain style of certain things, maybe I could just ask it and, and have it create that art. Um, or if I am need some ideas, the fact that this program is creating thousands of pictures and selecting 10 to show you, um, like that avocado chair. Um, I mean, that might be a springboard for, um, for other ideas or creativity. Um, 
I don't know. I'm not an artist and I don't have to do art. So I don't know. But if you there were in go. the in that business, maybe maybe that that would do something. It would be interesting getting into the copyright aspects of that. That's yes. Really so good. right. And that's worth bringing up. If all of the art that it generates came from, you know, a billion pictures that it found on the internet, who really owns what it created if pieces of it came from, you know, your art? Right. Well, and moreover, the art that it generates, who owns that? Yeah. The product. Yep. I wonder too, the value of art is that it is things that we are surprised by and moved by. And when you reduce that to something that is generative, uh, how, how much is that going to continue to impact us uh, in, in terms of getting us to buy things and that sort of stuff? And some wag recently proposed that the uh, the I am not a robot test of the future is going to be draw a hand and count the fingers on the hand. <laughs> yeah. You don't think my little pictures here I generated of the eight two-year-old dancers ready to square dance aren't cute? <laughs> I think I will become inured to that fairly quickly. Yes. No, I bet you're right. If you guys know uh, Ray Owens, uh, caller and uh, does the Square Dance Tech uh, website. He used uh, one of these uh, tools to create, you know, probably a thousand different pieces of Square Dance artwork that are free to download from his website. So you can take a peek and see what he's got. Ray Owens. I've also, on listening to podcasts, I found that they were talking about things that generate your voice. You give it samples of your voice and then you just type stuff in and it will speak it in your voice. And they played back to one person from two different sources of doing it. And, you know, you could sort of tell, but, but not really, it was really good. Um, you know, when one of the other people said, it sounds like you're, only 20 years old in that one, but it's still that person's voice. And they were thinking that these are probably commercially viable right now for just quick announcements between segments or something. Um, I'm just picturing that when Clark is writing, is writing choreography in the style of, of Vic Cedar and then playing it back with Vic's voice. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and selling tapes with <laughs> speaking of counterfeit stuff or midway there as an uh, enhancement of auto tune for all of those callers who can't carry a tune in a bucket yeah um, <clears throat> so we are going to be simulating callers and with things like 10 nations we're simulating dancers um Square dancing, as we know it, is going away, but computers will be able to talk to themselves and continue with the activity for generations to come. <laughs> is it? Go ahead, Dan. Were you going to say something? No, you're just leaning towards your monitor. Oh, I, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, you weren't because your monitor, you'd be facing the center of the screen if you're leaning towards your monitor. You're looking at the other one. Gotcha. Yeah, I was just wondering if it's it's getting to be that time when conversation is dwindling and we should consider I'm happy to go to lunch. I think we've probably <laughs> hit it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks again, Clark, and, and for everybody. Um hope you got your mind spinning, but not enough to give you headaches. And uh we will gather again sometime. Thank you, Clark. Thank you, Thank Don. You. Thanks, 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 Thanks,